So anyway, Pastor James, as I like to call him, wrote this book to the church as a pastor. He wrote the book of James to, to the early church to give them some instruction on how they should be, how they should live. And so today we get into chapter 4. Chapter 4 is the heart, if you will, of, of the book of James. Uh, chapter 4 is kind of, the beginning of chapter 4 is kind of the center of what James is trying to convince or, or challenge the early church to make sure that they don't live worldly, but they live for God. And he describes some things, in just a second I'll, I'll share them with you, uh, how your attitude or how their heart should be towards God. And I don't think it's changed to the church of today. I think it's the same struggles that this early church had, is the same struggles that we have today of keeping our life pure and holy before God, serving Him with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength, to, to, to flee sin and, and uh, sin nature, and then follow after the Spirit so we can be more like Jesus, so that the world will know the message that is so important that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. Amen? That's why He empowered us. By His Spirit, He gave us His Spirit of all those believers today, all those that believe today, were deposited in us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit reveals truth to us. Amen. And so we struggle with that. Let me, uh, Tina, would you come and I'm gonna let you read this for me. If you would stand, we're gonna read chapter uh, uh, four, verses one through twelve. Would you stand as we read the Word of God? What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight, you do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get. On your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, then, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Pray. Father, we thank you again for your word that changes life. Today, God, I pray that each one of us, each one of our hearts will be changed to be more like Jesus. Bless this time now. In your precious son's name, amen. amen. You may be seated. So in this, there's three points I'm going to make today on this. One, we need to recognize the source of our sinful behavior. Now, how many, don't raise your hand. <laughs> how many sinners are here today? We all are, right? Yeah. Understand, we need to, we need to understand the wickedness of our sin. We need to understand that sin separates us from God. We need to understand that when we sin, it brings us, it brings a division between us and God. And Jesus Christ made, if you will, that bridge between our sinful nature, our sinful life, back to a relationship with our Heavenly Father that brought us back to a relationship all the way back to the garden where Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve talked with God, walked with God every day. Amen? So we're going to talk about that today. We want to see that we need to go back to that 
place where we have restored to that relationship that we, come on, wouldn't it be great to be able to walk with God every day? You bet. We can, and we should, and when we don't, there's a reason for that, and it's going to take your humility and my humility, number three, to get back to that point where we're, we're walking with God and having victory over the sinful nature and have a, a victory over sin. So we need to recognize, number one, we need to recognize our sinful behavior. The problem is that our sinful behavior is not caused by our environment. Our sinful behavior is not caused by the things outside of us. The Bible plainly tells us that our sinful nature, the, the sinfulness that we, we struggle with, is within us. It's within you and me. We struggle with uh, doing right, and we know we should do right, as Paul described it, and we do wrong. How many have that problem this morning? Just me and Linda. So we know that most of us have that struggle where we have, we struggle with the idea that we have this, we want to do right, but we do wrong. We fight within us to do the right thing. And James tells us in the language that he's writing here is that the language that if we could all read Greek today, we would see that this language here is the language of war. We war within us. We fight within ourselves. And we struggle within ourselves to do what's right. And it's like a war fighting our sinful nature or our fleshly nature against the spirit nature. And he's talking, remember, Pastor James was talking to believers here, people that believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They, some of them saw Jesus raised from the dead. Some of them saw him being executed on the cross and then put in a grave. And then the third day later, he, they went to that grave site and he was gone. So these, these people saw this and knew this and they believed in Jesus, but they began to struggle because of the persecution that happened to them. Or life got to them, if you will. And Paul, James is reminding them here that, hey, you're struggling, that struggle you're fighting against is real because in you was deposited once you believe this Holy Spirit. How many know that the Holy Spirit is deposited in you mm -hmm. when you believe? Yes. Yeah. That's a whole lesson in itself, but you just gotta maybe take it by faith right now that yes, once you're a believer, the Spirit of God is in you. We'll talk about that maybe at a later time, but he's deposited in you. And so that spirit brings to you, as John chapter 14 tells us, to truth and righteousness and holiness and pureness and those things that would cause us to be the bride of Christ that God has intended us to be. Amen? And then we have this other part of us that God said he would never mess with. It's a part of us that we have to kind of give over to him. It's a part of us that we willfully submit ourselves to the authority of God in our life. We say to ourselves that self, you cannot longer do the things that you want to do. I have to do the things that God wants us to do. There's a fight, there's a struggle, there's a battle every day. And if people tell you it's not a battle, they're lying to you. Amen. We struggle with righteousness and holiness. We struggle with the fact that we need to do right. And we always wind up doing sometimes, not always, but the wrong thing. I'm here today to tell you that we can walk in victory. And you can overcome that in your life. If you would just listen to what I have to say today about being humble before God. And let God exalt you to a place that he wants you to be. And it will be higher and greater than the place that you could ever put yourself. Yes. God wants you there, but we struggle, we struggle and we war because we want, and if we don't get it, uh -huh. we're selfish in our nature, we want what we want, and then we get frustrated. We get frustrated in life because we don't get what we want. Everybody say amen. 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 Come on, you know it's right. We struggle, we want, we get frustrated over, over things, over uh, uh, situations, over our job, over finances, over relationships. We get frustrated because we want what we want. We want to be pleased and pleasured the way we want to. We want the things that we want, and we find ourselves frustration. And frustration, the, the center of your frustration is the center of your desire. What do I desire? Do I desire, this is me, I, I, let me tell you a story about myself, okay? So I've always wanted a fishing boat. How many know that I want a fishing boat? Like I've always said it like a thousand times, right? <laughs> when I get older, I'm gonna have a fishing boat. When I get this, I'm gonna have a fishing boat. Okay. Well, I got a fishing boat. 
I don't think of anything else but fixing up that little fish. And it's a little boat. It's like a 14-foot aluminum boat. There's, it's, it's, there's nothing fancy about this boat. It's just a boat. It's got a little motor, 15-horse motor on it. It was my dad's. He's getting too old. He can't use it. So he said I could come and bring it up to Wisconsin. He wants me to go fishing. He likes the fact that I could do that. But my thoughts when I go to sleep, even when I was praying in the office before service today, I was thinking about going home and fixing the trailer and the hitch on it and putting the, uh, a trolling motor on and getting the, the electrical part hooked up, which if any electrical engineers here, please let me know. I can use your help. But anyway, uh, I'm going to hook this boat. I mean, all I can do is think about this boat. I'm going last night. I'm ready to fall asleep praying for you guys, praying for the service. And all I'm thinking about, I mean, I'm praying, but I'm thinking about... Uh. Because my desire is I want to go fishing, right? <laughs> is that a wrong desire? I don't know. If it takes me away from God, I'll say yes. Uh, Tina and I, when we were first young, young Christians, very young, we would uh, go fishing in the uh, ocean. And in the ocean, it's fun because you can catch a little fish this big or you can catch a fish this big on the same bait. It's amazing, right? And we would fish and fish. And so one day we were fishing we spent the night. We said, we're going to go fishing. We're going to spend the night fishing. Why not? What if I miss church one time? It's not a big deal, right? So we're going to get there to the pier on Saturday. We're going to fish all Saturday. We're going to fish all through the night, all through Sunday, and go home Sunday afternoon with our big catch. Which I don't think we... The King Mackerel were running. That's right. So, and I just got into fishing for King Mackerel, which is a whole other story in itself. But anyway, so we, we, we had our friends that we discipled to follow Jesus. They went to church on Sunday morning and we could hear they wore cowboy boots too on a wooden pier. You could hear them from the when they first got on the pier all the way down. They were walking. We just want to jump off the pier. But our, our desire, so we got we gave away all our fishing equipment after that. Because our desire for fishing became higher than our desire for God. And that was some good equipment, let me tell you. We didn't buy cheap stuff. Because we had cheap stuff, so we bought good stuff. And like, we got to give this away because it's distraction. Maybe I should give my boat away, right? I put it in Andy's name, so maybe we can give it him and <laughs> still be able to go fishing. But our desire, we have wrong motives in our lives. Our desire, our frustrations for our lives, what we're frustrated about something, comes out of our desire to have something <coughs> greater than God. And God wants to be number one in your life. Yes, that's right. I was telling Tina, I don't want to preach long today. I just want to like say that what I have to say because I know it's going to be right into your heart today. I know you're just going to be right to the point of, are we serving God or not serving God? Are his desires of his will over our will? Sometimes pride gets us in the way. We want to be the best. We want to have the best education, the best car, the best house, the best yard, the best, 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 right? We just, what are people going to think of me if I, you know, don't have nice things? And it doesn't really matter, does it? Because God loves the poor just as much as he loves the rich. And he loves everybody in between. And the things that you have don't mean nothing to God. All God wants is your heart. That's right. yeah. He doesn't want anything else. He doesn't, he, he'll ask you to sacrifice sometimes. He'll ask you to give up your will for his will. Think what, about Jesus, if Jesus' heart wasn't toward God. Remember when he went in the garden and he cried out to God? He said, not my will, God, but your will be done. Yes. That was right before he went to the cross. He was going to suffer and die the most horrible death on earth. And he did that for you and me. And he's asking you, would you still be a light? Would you be a light in the world? Would you be a light in your workplace? Would you be a light? He's not asking you for money. He just said, be a light to the world around you and bring people to me because I'm here. I died for their sins. I died for their... I died for them. So everybody has value in God's eyes, even if you judge them wrongly. That's what we get into the, towards the end. Stop judging people. Because you're judging God when you do. Right? Come on. God created that person. And even if that person has a life that's so messed up that you go, man, I'm glad I'm not that person. You say, God loves that person more than you love that person. And we're supposed to demonstrate that love to that person so they can know the love of the Father. That's my, I, man, I'm, I'm so broken up over this right now. I, I'm like, what are we doing here at Capital City Church? What are we doing? What is our title? What are, what are, 
What's our purpose in life? Are we, and I'm just, this is for me, are we being the light of the world that God wants us to be? Because there's only one thing we need to do is share Jesus with the world around us. And like we teach, we teach over, and Pastor Andy and myself, we are to be disciples of Jesus, it means we're followers and lovers of Jesus and learners of Jesus. And then we're supposed to be disciple makers, like teach other people how to learn about Jesus and how to be like Jesus and so they can be disciple makers. Oh, I can't wait for that day where you get a hold of the fact that it's not about coming here on Sunday morning or even Wednesday nights, which is great and awesome. But as you begin to take what you've learned and share it with the lost people around you, I don't know a lot. You don't have to know a lot. Just know that God loves you and share that love with people around you. It's amazing what, how it can change your life. And change, you can just the energy that happens is the Spirit of God comes alive in you as you begin to give away what God has given you. How many have uh, love to give finance, like money, like give, you know, there's a few of us that are, are money givers. Tina and I love giving away money. So I had, uh, last week I had $300 in my wallet. I have, I think, 20 bucks left. Um, <laughs> because when you see somebody in need, right, you just want to help them, right? You just want to, just want to give. It's just, uh, it's what we do. It's, it's, it's part of helping the, the person in need. It's, I'm so far off my sermon notes, but that's okay. You understand what I'm saying, right? It's like, oh, we have to have a heart after God. Not my will, but your will be done. Well, I just say that for a fact. Just say that out loud right now. Not my will, Not my will. but your will be done. Your will will be done. Not my will, Not but your will be done. Verse 3 says, I want what you... Uh, let's go to verse 3 real quick here. Let's look at verse 3. We didn't get past verse 1 there. That was good. Um, <laughs> verse 2 says, you want something, but you don't, you, don't, uh, you don't get it. You kill and you covet which is part of the law, you know, old law, you just do whatever you can to get what you want, but you cannot have it what you want. You quarrel and you fight, and I don't, we don't have that in our church, but you fight within yourselves of not doing things for God. You do not have because you do not ask. What is that saying for? We just use that verse so much. You have not because you ask not. Have you ever heard that, Christians? Believers, right? You have not because you ask, but what it's talking about, I don't have victory over myself because I don't ask God to help me. Yeah. Because I, what happens, and this is what happens to most of us, we, we get a point where we sin, we, we want to hide from God. Right? You ever be a little kid, a little kid will do something wrong, they'll run in their bedroom, or, or they'll, they'll hide from God, right? Or in, in the Bible, and John tells us that the people like darkness rather than the light, so you go hide in the darkness, you go hide in your sin, but you, 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 don't, you don't ask God, God, help me overcome this problem in my life, and God will give you victory over it, but we don't ask for that. And I'm just telling you, encourage you this morning, ask. God will help you. You know what your sin is. You know what your struggles with. You know what your pride is. You know what you're dealing with in your heart. God today will say, if you ask him for that, to overcome that in your life, he will help you overcome it. How many say amen? amen. Come on, I want to be overcome of the sin in my life so I can be more like Jesus. Yes. I want to love like Jesus. I don't want to <laughs> judge like the world judge. I want to be like Jesus in the world. And that's amen. what we're made to do. But we don't have that because we're not asking God the right thing. We ask with the wrong motives. We start asking for things. We ask for wealth, we ask for education, we ask for things, and we, we're asking amiss, we're asking for the wrong thing. That's what, the, this, what James is saying. Let's ask for the right thing. Let's ask God to oh, help us overcome so we can be the best what we are as a believer in your field. I mean, think about people that, and I think of Madison, we have a lot of people with great education. You could use it for the glory of God to an amazing uh, thing. How did you understand that? How did you find that? How did you research that out? Well, God gave me this answer because I was praying, I was asking him because I couldn't figure this out, and God gave me the answer. Or you could say, when I got to this research part in my, my paper, and I, I, I found the answer. I remember studying about NASA when they discovered um, part of the uh, re-entry of the, uh, I don't know, it was Apollo or one of the, the, the landings. They, they, they couldn't figure out the math to bring, the, bring them back to Earth the way they're supposed to. And the, the scientists that was there praying as God and, 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 and he got the right calculation so they could bring them back safely. So, I mean, God is in everything. He's in everything that you do. He wants to be part of that. Amen? So ask, don't ask him. Don't ask for yourself is what the word of God is saying here. Ask God. And then he, but he says this. This is kind of interesting. And I want to, this is really hard too because I'm going to say this. 
Pastor Andrew said it last week, so or two weeks ago, so I can, so I can say it. You know, remember he talked about Hosea? And Hosea talked about he married a prostitute, and the prostitute, you know, was his wife, and then his wife left him again, and he the Lord told him to remarry that prostitute, and he said, This was just like Israel, this was just like the church. You know, you, you come to God and then you go out back in the world. You come to God and you go back in the world. But God's love for that woman never changed. Hosea's love for her never changed. That was his wife, amen. And God told her to marry him. And look at this verse, look at verse four. I'm showing the word of God now. This is not me, but I mean. You know, take it for what's worth. It says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? So anytime you bring glory to yourself, you don't bring it to God, then you're, you're, hate, you're hate God. That's what it says. It's like you're, you're, you're telling God, I, I'm better than, I'm greater than you. Even though you created me, even though you gave me my intelligence, every, even though you blessed me with all these things, I'm better than you, God, because I'm going to take the glory for what I just did. And that's why the power of God is not in the world today. Amen. We're taking all the credit, and all the credit goes to God. Amen? I was thinking about me being in, in uh, middle school in special ed classes. Now I'm here preaching to you guys. <laughs> you know, I, I, I still marvel at that. I have trouble reading. I still have trouble spelling. I, got, I, I sit in my office for hours trying to figure out what I'm going to say next to you guys. And you know what? God says, you're doing it. I said, God, you got Andy can do it better than I can. Let Andy do it. No, he says, no, you're doing it. Okay, but praise God because I'm doing it because I trust God. God is greater than me. And he says, you're going to do this. Yeah. And God has something greater for you to do than what you can do yourself. Because God has a big plan. And we include God in our lives, he'll show you what that plan is. And, and, and the bottom line is that plan is to glorify Jesus in the earth. Yes. And he's going to use you and me to do that. Amen? Amen. That's hard, Pastor Bob, but I love you all, right? So, how do we fix this? How do we go by being a bride that's filthy and dirty and going back to our old life and our own habits? How can we be a bride as Jesus is looking for that's without spot or wrinkle? Could you imagine, could you imagine Tina walking down the aisle on her wedding day and her wedding dress was all full of dirt and garbage? I mean, I'd be standing here with the pastor, you know, I remember that day, and there was my bride coming down the, the, the thing all beautiful in her white dress, and her hair was all done up. It was just an amazing, amazing moment in my life, and I think that's what it's going to be like when Jesus comes to get us back. He's going to have, he's, he's anticipating the bride coming, amen, and we're going to go together with him in heaven, and it's going to be the culmination of all that he did. He's the, the earth is going to be saved, and there's going to be heaven, new heaven, new earth. All oh, that's going to be amazing stuff. But, I mean, if he came back for us and our wedding dress was all dirty, filthy with sin and pride and disappointments and all the junk, that he's not coming back for a bride like that. He's coming back for a bride that's you and me. The church is the bride. I read the end of the book. It tells me that. He's coming back for a, a spotless bride. That's right. That means we have to we have to admit to ourselves that we're not perfect and we have some flaws in our lives. We have to admit to ourselves that hey, you know, we're not. We could be like Hosea, the the prostitute would go back and prostitute herself over and over and over and over again, and then that and and but God still loves. Loves her. Yep. And loves you. And he's saying, Phew. So how do we how do we handle this? Look at the scripture in verse 7, if you will. I, uh, James 4, 7. It's how we deal with this, and it's how we overcome this. It says, Submit yourselves then to God. Stop. Whatever you want, God, my life is yours. You have a better plan for my life than I could ever plan out for myself. Nothing wrong with planning things out either. God will direct you. It says, when you submit or humble yourself to God, then it says, you resist the devil and the devil will flee. See, the problem with us, we just want to have an open door. Devil, come on in, do whatever you want. 
It's not that bad. It's only a little sin. Nobody's going to know. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to my kids. <laughs> I was like, I was like, it's only a, I, we had this story, and I think some of you might have heard this. If you haven't heard this, if you already heard this, you already know what's going to happen. But, you know, I always tell my kids uh, about eating brownies, and um, and if I took got some dog poop from the yard and I mixed it in with the brownies, you wouldn't know it, but it was only a little bit in there. Would you still eat the brownies, right? And that's like sin is. I mean, sin's like you just have a little bit of dog poop. Nobody's going to know. It doesn't even smell anymore. It actually smells like cookies now, or brownies, right? You don't, right? It's just a little bit of sin. It's just, it's not, you know, of course they wouldn't eat it, and I'm sure you wouldn't either. So the question is, why would you allow yourself to do that in front of God? Because God knows everything anyway. It's just a little bit of sin. So it says, if you resist the devil, how do you do that? When you feel those voices in your head or those temptations coming, you can say no. Let's practice that. Say no. No. Oh, good job. All right? That's how it works. But you can say no in the name of Jesus, and you have power and authority. So when sin enters or sin comes at you or things, temptations come to you, and you say no in the name of Jesus, say that with me. No in the name of Jesus. You have authority that Jesus gave you to resist every fiery dart of the enemy, every deception that the enemy brings in your life, every deceitful thought, everything that will cause you to turn away from God, you can have authority over that if you just say no in the name of Jesus. You have that authority. Come on, smile. You got authority yeah. that God gave you because Jesus paid the penalty for your sin and he gave you that authority and now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father praying and interceding for you so you can use the authority, authority that you have so you don't have to be a bride all dirty and barely make it into heaven. Yeah. No, you can walk with pride. I'm a child of God and it might cost you your life. I'm a child of God. I will not say no to God. And we have people all over the world now being, getting their heads cut off and being burned at the, inside of uh, uh, metal cages or being drowned because of, they won't say no to anything but Jesus. They, always, they won't say no. They'll say no to everything. Amen? They're not saying no to Jesus. And they're dying for that. That's happening in the world. It's not happening in Madison yet, okay? But it's happening in the world. They're saying no. They're saying no. I, I have authority. I have Jesus. I'm not going to give up Jesus. Jesus saved me from my sin. We don't have that. We don't have it in our maybe in our hearts. We need to get the fact that we know that Jesus saved us from our sin. Maybe we don't know that or don't recognize that enough that we are saved from our sin. And without the salvation of Jesus, our destination is hell. There's a judgment coming, and we're all going to be judged. And those with found without Jesus. Those that don't follow after Jesus, those that aren't disciples of Jesus, those that aren't doing the things that Jesus did on earth, those people are going to take the elevator down. Verse 7, submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God. Listen, what do I do then? How do I know what words? How do I know? I feel empty. I feel... Uh, there's, some, there's a void in my life because now that I'm not in the world, there's a different lifestyle I'm living now, and it's not as fun as I had before. Right? There's a different lifestyle. There's something different. I, I, I'm doing other things than, than God. And God, I mean, really, Christianity seems to be boring. It's more fun over there. Listen, this is what we have to do. You have to resist the devil, those thoughts. And he says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Think about this. God himself will draw near to your heart, near to you, because all you have to do is come near to him. If you just turn your thoughts and your heart toward God, and he'll come there instantly. And what happens? He'll wash you up. He'll clean the stuff out. He'll say, you're forgiven. I know you had that horrible life. I know you were involved in the drugs. I know you were doing these things. Listen, I don't care. I want to, I want to make you like a bride. I'll clean you up. Because my son paid the penalty of your sin. And you draw near to God, I'm telling you, folks, as soon as you draw near to God, that instant, when you say, yes, God, or you bow your knee, whatever it takes, 
at that moment you say, yes, God, all of a sudden his presence is there. Mm -hmm. And he says to me, I don't know how he does it to you, but he says, hey, Bob, can I kind of work on this area right here in your life? Because you need to be a little more gentle. Yes, God, you can do that. Well, let me love your people like you love them. You know what I, when I pray often? This is my prayer often. I pray this often. Lord, let me love the world like you love them. Yeah. Let me not look at them in judgment. Let me look at them like you do. That, pray that prayer. That's, I, I've said this many times already, but it's a hard thing because we're so easy and we see somebody that's not doing as well as we do, we want to automatically judge them. Come on. I know I'm right. Everybody does it. Come on. You can admit it. We just, we need to not do that. How do we not do that? Because as we draw near to God, then we get the heart of God for the people around us. Amen? It says then, it says right here, it's, it's, you come near to God, and then you get washed up. Look at what it says. Look at verse 7 and verse 8 here. It says, come, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee, right? Come near, come to him, submit yourself to God, I'm going to humble myself to God, I'm going to resist those thoughts in, in the enemy, right? And then it says, come near to God, so God, I'm coming near to you, and then what it says next? It says, wash your hands. It didn't say, wash your hands first and then come near to God. Because we can't do it. We can never wash ourselves clean enough to be in God's presence. We can't do it. There's nothing we can do to earn His love. There's nothing we can do to wash ourselves or make ourselves clean. There's nothing at all we can get ready to be in God's presence. We need the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. It's the only way we're clean. Then you come to God. He cleansed you by the Son of God who prayed for the penalty of your sin. Now you're clean. Now I can walk with God. Say, wow, God, walk with me, right? Now I can walk in the garden with him. Now I can walk with him in life in every situation that comes up. He's right there with me because I'm clean because of what he, Jesus did for me and I know that. It's not, I'm not trying to get myself clean. I can't do it. I try. It doesn't work. It may be for a moment I feel good. Oh, I stopped smoking or I stopped drinking or I stopped doing this or stopped doing that so I can be in God's presence. It's not, it's not good enough. It just isn't good enough. All I have to do is come to him. And God made it so easy. It's so easy we can't even understand it. Submit to God first. God, you are our supreme being. You know everything. You are my father. You are my creator. You knew, you knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb. Before I was conceived, you knew me, God. Think about that. Yeah, before I was conceived, you knew me. And you know my plans and the plans you have for me. Isaiah and, and um, uh, Jeremiah had the plans I have for you, prosper you, and all those wonderful things. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna know, I'm gonna get close to God because He can take care of the junk that I got myself into. Amen. And then it says this. Uh, it says, "Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded." Right. Now, I'm, this is really important. I want to stop here for a second. You double-minded. I'm gonna, we're gonna end real shortly here. We're, we become double-minded because we're following God and we're not following God. We believe God's the Son of God, but then we don't believe God's the Son of God. That doubt and that fear comes from the enemy. All right? Why am I double-minded? Why do I weigh back and forth on my belief or my unbelief? Amen? I don't, well, one day I believe there's God, and then the next day I don't believe. One day I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and the next day I don't believe. Is this all real? What does that come from? Where does that confusion come from? It comes from the devil because he wants to keep you confused. But you have authority of that. So you resist the devil. I resist that thought. No, I know who he is. I believe who he is. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe he rose again on the third day. I believe he's sitting at the right hand of Father making intercession for me. I believe he's coming back. I believe he is Jesus. Amen. Nothing can take that away from me. That's why the early church could die and be martyred for him. Now it says, grieve and mourn and wail and change your laughter into mourning because, hey, I don't realize, I realize that I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Humble yourself before God, the Lord, and he will lift you up. I was talking at uh, one of our prayer meetings. It was, uh, or was it at home, I think? We were talking about uh, praying. Has anybody ever heard the term praying through? It's kind of an old churchy thing. Some of us older folks know that. Sorry if we're dating ourselves, but younger people don't understand that. So we, when the pastor would call for an altar time, we'd come to the altar and people would ask God to forgive them or change their lives or respond to the sermon. And then there was a time where we just prayed through. 
What that meant is like you just pray and you stayed up in the altar. I, I used to love doing that. Just stay here. Everybody in the church was leaving and stuff. And I'd, just, I'd be the last one at the altar, not to make myself holy. I just want to pray through what Pastor said. He said that one, pray through till you see, receive peace from God over the situation you're dealing with. So the pastor said I had sin in my life. I, I responded to that. I come to the altar, recognizing I humbled myself before God. I said, God, change me to be like Jesus. And I stay at the altar, right? See, was, she with the kids were running around. She had five kids, so she'd be running around. And there was Daddy at the altar. He wasn't quite done yet, right? Why? Because I knew I couldn't be a good dad or a good husband or a good Christian unless I spent time with God. And I was responding to what the pastor said. I wanted to know, so I would come to the altar and I just pray. And it was sometimes it was short. Sometimes it was five, ten minutes. But sometimes it was a minute. Sometimes it was much longer. Uh, because I wanted to feel the peace. I wanted to, I didn't want to just come out of a religious obligation because pastor said so. I wanted to really get the hold of Jesus' garment. And I wanted Jesus to change my life to be in his image. Yeah. Amen. I wanted Jesus to, I wanted to be like Jesus. And sometimes I did, and sometimes I didn't do it. But I did as much as I could. Amen. And that's what God's asking you. You do what you can do, and he will do the rest. Mm -hmm. But you can't clean yourself up. You have to come and let him do it for you. Amen. Then verse 10 just goes right back to the same word that we've heard a hundred times. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And then the last part is don't judge each other either. So I see Miss Linda at the altar. I'm not going to say, well, look, she must have a lot of problems in her life. No, we just like pray for them. Pray for each other here. Pray for your brothers and sisters that we can be righteous and holy, that we can be clean, we can be a bride without spot or wrinkle. That we could be ready when Jesus, the bridegroom, comes. He's looking for a bride. That's you and me, the church. How many know that? You're the bride. The church is the bride. And Jesus is coming back for you. And we have to be ready. And that means we have to be clean in our spirit and be purified before God. And for us that aren't that way, I'm just going to give you an opportunity today to get let's make it right. Let's, let's, let's deal with it today. Amen? Let's say, God, let's take it a moment and say, God, I'm not the pure and holy person that you want me to be, but would you help me be that? It takes a humble heart to do that. Let's stand together. Tina, would you come and...